Hello and welcome to Geology 12. Today I want to talk about the atmosphere. I've already talked a little bit about this in the lecture, but I want to add this video to our lecture series here. So remember, the key thing about the atmosphere is this uneven solar radiation. Uneven heat needs to be moved around, right? And it's moved around by the atmosphere in these large atmospheric circulation cells. So the atmosphere moves in response to this difference in heating, right? And so we talked about the those feral cells and the Hadley cells and the the you know the polar cells up in up in here. And so remember, um, that would be a primary force: the heat coming from the sun, causing this warming in the equatorial regions, and it's going to be cooler because it receives less solar radiation at, at the higher latitudes. Remember, because more light is being reflected. Uh, as opposed to being absorbed over here in the equator, right? And so as we go along here, think of that solar energy as a primary force. A secondary force would be something that will affect that heat that moves around, and that's Coriolis. We've already talked about how in the southern hemisphere, things move to the left. In the northern hemisphere, objects are deflected to the right. So review your notes on the Coriolis force there. And then here are those six atmospheric cells that I was talking about there. Now, when we look at the atmosphere, you'll see that about 80% of the air, of the air molecules, reside in the troposphere, which is the lowest band of, of separation for our atmosphere. And note that we do have these different bands. They're basically uh, separated by temperature and what's happening with temperature and also how air is mixing in these different regions. And obviously, 80% uh, is down here in the troposphere, but you can see there's quite a bit of temperature change in here. And the most amount of mixing occurs in the troposphere, right? And then there's very little mixing once you get up in the stratosphere or mesosphere here, right? The other thing to note here is our atmosphere really is about a, about 100 kilometers thick. And once you go above 100 kilometers, the molecules are so far apart that you really can't consider them part of the atmosphere. All right, so other things that are happening in the troposphere is photosynthesis, right? Essential for life. Uh, the water cycle, evaporation, condensation, precipitation, all that that we've talked about, or we will talk about more later on in this course. And then uh, again, what's really determining uh, these bands, this the troposphere, stratosphere, are the temperature gradients. So the, the really the gradient is the steepness or the slope of this line. You can see it's pretty steep in the troposphere. It's also pretty steep in the mesosphere here, but compared to the stratosphere, it's not as steep, right? So in other words, there's quite a bit of change in temperature in the troposphere as compared to the stratosphere as you're moving to higher elevations here. And then the ozone occurs anywhere from 15 to 30 kilometers, which means it's gonna be up in the stratosphere. So one thing the stratosphere has, it has the ozone layer. And we'll talk more about that in a moment. As we go on to the next slide here, note that this troposphere, where most water and all weather occurs, right? Because we have the key thing, there's mixing. That's the key word, this mixing in this troposphere. But other things you should jot down, and I did mention these in lectures, is that water has a residence time of eight to 10 days. So you know, we see evaporation, it condenses, but then within about a week or so, that water will rain back down to earth and become part of the water cycle. This is methane, CH4. So note that methane has a little bit longer residence time, about nine years. CFCs, which are, are chlorofluorocarbons, uh, which are harmful to the ozone layer, actually harmful to the ozone layer. Note that they're 40 to 15 year residence times. CFCs are also not natural. They're produced by humans for air conditioning and other refrigerants. And then uh, carbon dioxide, which is natural, uh, has a has a longest residence time. So this the reason I bring this up because all four of these are considered greenhouse gases. So when we talk about the greenhouse effect and global warming, uh, it really it's all these trap heat. Really, what they're trapping they're trapping the infrared radiation leaving the Earth, right? So solar radiation is coming into Earth, heating the planet up, and it's mostly the shorter wavelengths that are coming from the sun going into the Earth, and then what the Earth emits emits longer wavelengths. And, um, and then as that's going up into our atmosphere, these gases t tend to trap that heat and send it back down to Earth. So that kind of warms our planet. It's, that's called the greenhouse effect. Um, although when we start seeing higher concentrations of these, then we start seeing more of that heat trap. And then that's the global warming part of it, right? But water, it's, it's a really strong greenhouse gas, but note, very short residence time so it's not gonna you know it's not a, a, as important as carbon dioxide 
And then um, methane is actually 30 times stronger of a greenhouse gas. In other words, it can trap heat about 30 times more than carbon dioxide. But again, it has about a nine year uh, residence time. And then uh, CSC is kind of on the same line there. But one thing we have done, at least in North America, we've banned these chlorofluorocarbons. Um, and we are seeing a decrease in this, um, in this ozone damaging, the hole in the ozone, so to speak. All right, so uh, it's a little bit about the troposphere. And then one thing we should add here is that there is this thing called the tropopause. And the tropopause is the boundary between the, um, the stratosphere and the troposphere. And so again, looking at our troposphere here, right? So uh, there's a change in temperature around six and a half degrees per a thousand meters as you go higher up. And uh, what is the source of heat in the troposphere, right? So it's really the heat bounces off, bouncing off Earth, right? So Earth's surface is a major source of heat. And it's mostly that IR. And what I mean by IR radiation is uh, the infrared, right? Infra red and that's the usually the longer uh, uh, wavelength right I'll put L for wavelength and then uh, warmer air beneath cooler air right so we have this warmer air beneath cooler air uh, this condition is unstable so you'll see mixing right so whenever there's warmer air beneath cooler air there, there's mixing so this warm air will rise and cool in fact it will rise and expand one of the things about warm air rising it will uh, expand and cool. And if there's any moisture in that warmer air, you'll see condensation and then precipitation, right? So air in the troposphere does not, does a lot of mixing, right? Because usually warmer air is rising, being heated by Earth's surface up here, then rising to these higher temperatures. I talked about inversion over here in lecture. And so if there's cold air, like a cold front comes in and it gets pushed underneath warm air, so that cold air uh, which is more dense is moving at our surface and like coming off the ocean for example and then it's going to push warm air up so now you have warm air on top of cold air so that leads to an era where uh, the cold denser air is already at the bottom so there's very little mixing here so so that's what we call a temperature inversion and one of the problems with temperature inversion especially in coastal cities with lots of pollution is because there's little mixing smog, you know, exhaust uh, ends up being trapped uh, at that lower elevation, right, and makes for these smoggy days, right. So that's one of the one of the issues with temperature temperature inversion there. And then when we're looking at the stratosphere. So remember the key thing about the stratosphere is there's little mixing up in here. Also, the ozone layer occurs in the stratosphere between 15 and 30 kilometers. So I have kind of a little signal there. And then the other thing about the what the ozone do, layer does, it, it does block ultraviolet radiation. So think of this ultraviolet as the, the lower, shorter wavelength. So when we're looking at the electromagnetic spectrum, right, it goes from cosmic rays, gamma rays, x-rays, UV, ultraviolet. Then the visible light is what we see uh, coming, the white light, which can be s separated into the colors of the rainbow, right? And then the infrared, now we're looking at a little bit longer. So when we say longer wavelengths, we're talking about wavelengths that, that are longer wavelength than the um, than visible light, right? And then we get to microwaves over here, television waves, all that. So, but a, a key thing is infrared longer, ultraviolet violet uh, shorter wavelengths, right? So in this UV band, right? Note that there's three types of ultraviolet radiation, right? There's UVA, UVB, and UVC. UVA is a, is the least energetic. It's going to have um, uh, the longest wavelength of those short wavelengths of UV. So it's not as damaging and it does pass through the ozone. Uh, this is what can give you the sunburn, right? And so that's why you want to wear sunscreen. Whereas UVB and UVC, these have shorter wavelengths. They're more energetic, but fortunately our ozone layer blocks the UVB and UVC. Usually in this in this uh, stratosphere, the temperature doesn't really change a whole lot with elevation, so that's why I kind of question you know a, a temperature increase, right? But uh, it's pretty stable in this um, in this stratosphere. Also, sometimes volcanic eruptions will be able to spread some ash into this stratosphere, you know, above 15, 20 kilometers, and this ash can be up in the stratosphere for five years or longer, right? And one thing that if we get particles up in here they can act as a, sort of like a little umbrella and shields the sun from some of this radiation. 
And so after big eruptions, the planet has been known to cool like by three to four degrees centigrade in those three to four years, five years after those eruptions. Um, for example, in, 19, in 1883, after the Krakatoa eruption, there are many articles and actually there's even a book called The Year Without Summer, where um, in England, basically the flowers didn't bloom in 1883, 1884 in those years because of, of that volcanic eruption. All right, so as we go along into the stratosphere, you can see this is a good little, little uh, separation. So we see the, the troposphere here, and then that the tropopause, now the stratosphere, and then, then we get it to the mesosphere and thermosphere up in here. And back in here, we're about 100 kilometers and we're into space, right? So here's another cartoon showing some of the stratosphere, where the mountains are. So we're going to go at about 10 to 14 kilometers in the stratos stratosphere. Then there's a tropopause. And then um, in the stratosphere, uh, I had to see, oh yeah, so the Chinese weather balloon was at about 18. That's the one we shot down, right? And so that's up here at about 18.3 uh, kilometers. And I thought kind of interesting is that if you think about where spy planes are, spy planes are usually up here above 20 kilometers uh, or around 18 to 20 kilometers, whereas weather balloons should be up here at about 30 kilometers, right? So why was this weather balloon down at the same elevation as a spy plane? Anyways, that's something to think about. So uh, as then as we go on to the next sphere, the mesosphere, note that in the mesosphere, we're looking at um, the coldest temperatures in the atmosphere. There's very few gas molecules up in there. They're very widely spaced. 99.9% uh, .9 of the air are in the layers below the mesosphere. So I guess 0.1% would be in this mesosphere. Meteorites burn up in here, and there is a temperature decrease with, um, with altitude as you're going in this sphere. So if we look over here, you can see that temperature is decreasing in the mesosphere. And then we talked about the meteorites burning up in this uh, mesosphere. And then finally, the thermosphere, uh, it's the hottest temperatures. There's a temperature increase because we're seeing more of that short wave radiation, X-rays, gamma rays. Remember, those are even shorter wavelengths than ultraviolet light. Also in this region, we have the ionosphere where gases are ionized. Um, and, and we especially see that in the, um, in, the, in the polar regions, whether it's North Pole or South Pole, it's where the magnetic field is coming in and we see the aurora borealis, right? Solar wind particles uh, spiral along magnetic field lines toward Earth. And I showed a couple of slides in class um, with this. In fact, I have one coming up here showing that those Van Allen belts. Uh, uh, but just all you gotta know is that this, this is our magnetic field. And as the charged particles come from the sun here, they're, they're deflected by the magnetic field of Earth and then they'll come in either at the south, at the North Pole or the South Pole, wherever the magnetic lines of force are re-entering Earth, right? And so we, we get this really protection from the solar wind there. As we go along here and we look at the composition of the atmosphere, the majority or the major gas is nitrogen, 78%. Uh, we have 21% carbon to ox uh, uh, oxygen and then less than 1% argon. And then there's these other gases like CO2, water vapor, and some of the ones I mentioned earlier, like methane, that contribute to uh, global warming and the, and the greenhouse effect there. But also there'll be some dust particles, ash, like I mentioned earlier. And these may act as um, particles where water can nucleate and then cause uh, condensation and eventually lead to precipitation. All right, so as we go along here, uh, I mentioned the electromagnetic spectrum. So just know that visible light uh, I mean, they're all very short wavelengths, right? So remember, we, we, when we did ocean waves, we talked about the wavelength, which is a distance between wave crest to wave crest or wave trough to wave trough, right? The really short wavelengths, in fact, you can see these are in, in nanometers, right? So very small. So nano is, is uh, one times 10 to the nine meters, right? So it's basically a, a billionth of a meter. So they're really small, 700 down to 400 nanometers. And then obviously you're getting smaller with the um, X-rays, gamma rays, ultraviolet light over here. So energy travels through space and materials, right? So it radiates. So that's this, you know, think of a radiant energy. Radiation is transfer of energy between two objects by electromagnetic waves. So if you feel a, a, a heat radiating off a heater, that probably heat in the infrared uh, spectrum you're feeling there. Whereas conduction is heat traveling between two objects that are in, in direct contact. Like if we have a hot pot, 
and you put it on a countertop, that heat will transfer to the counter pot, uh, to the counter surface and heat up that surface or burn that surface, right? The other new term in here is this idea of, of reflection and albedo. So, um, so obviously reflection is, is the, the energy waves bouncing off an object, right? And albedo is the reflectivity of, of an object. So high albedo, so if we have something that's high, then it reflects more um, uh, energy, right? Like snow has a high albedo. It's going to reflect more of that solar radiation, right? Whereas uh, oceans are darker, oceans tend to absorb more of that. So ocean, an ocean would have low albedo. So snow, ice has a high albedo. Uh, oceans um, have a low have a low albedo. So in other words, low albedo means it gets warmer. It, it, it absorbs more heat. Temperature and heat are kind of, they're two really different things. Heat is really a, a unit of energy. Um, it's, uh, and we use a calorie to, dis, to, to describe heat. And one thing that uh, we can add here, so let's add here, it takes one calorie to heat one gram of water by one degree centigrade. So that gives an idea of what the calorie is. And heat measures the material's total energy. And then, um, remember, heat is measuring the velocity of the molecules vibrating and how many, right? So it's a quantity. You can qual quantify that, right? Whereas temperature, it just measures how fast they're vibrating, right? It doesn't account to how many. So we really can uh, associate a value to this a quantity. So heat measures velocity and number. Of, mo of molecules vibrating, whereas temperature only measures the velocity. In oceanography, we talked about latent heats, latent heat effusion. So the numbers to remember here, this is 80 calories uh, per, um, per gram, right, of latent heat. So in other words, a fusion to convert water to ice, you need to remove 80 calories per gram, right? Or if you want to melt ice, you need to add 80 calories per gram. And then for vaporization, remember it was a 540. So 540 calories per, uh, per gram. So if you wanted to vaporize water, you need to add 540 calories per gram to vaporize that water, right? Uh, and then when you condense that vapor, you release those 540 calories per gram. And that was, that's what leads to storms and, and wind patterns, right? Uh, remember, the reason we're seeing more calories uh, for vaporization is because we need to break the hydrogen bonds, right? Whereas fusing, we just we're just rearranging the water molecule there. So then I talked about heat capacity and specific heat. So basically, uh, that's kind of this this you know the heat capacity of water is right here, one calorie to heat one gram uh, by one degree centigrade, right? So water has a very high heat capacity, right? And so we'll do an experiment in lab to kind of show that. And so I discussed this already in class: latent heat effusion and the latent heat of vaporization. So I'll kind of skip through this here. And then this is kind of that summary figure that we that we talked about in class last week as well. The, this slide, most of the energy that reaches the Earth's surface comes from the sun. And, may, and, and you can see that about 43% of that radiation is in the visible light spectrum, but we also see some infrared, ultraviolet, X-rays, gamma rays. So these are the really short wavelength, ultraviolet, and then these really short gamma rays. Um, altogether, we call that white light. And then if you put white light through a prism, you can see you can separate it into the, the different colors. So note that the shorter wavelengths seem to be refracted or bent more than the longer wavelengths. So, and then as you go from red up even longer than red would be the infrared. Shorter than violet would be the UV or ultraviolet, right? So a prism of water or water droplets can break the white light into different wavelengths so that you separate you know, the separate colors appear, right? So the rainbow. In fact, there was a beautiful rainbow here in Santa Cruz yesterday. All right, so as we go along here, um, I did talk about a little bit about why the sky is blue. And so basically what happens is blue light is scattered more than the other colors. And by scattering that blue light, it gives the atmosphere that blue color, right? So again, blue light is being scattered. This is why we see a blue sky most of the time, right? So, um, but about half that solar radiation that strikes the top of the atmosphere is filtered out before it reaches the ground. So much of it, that ultraviolet radiation, really the UVB and the UVC. Remember UVA kind of make, that's the longer one that reaches the surface. This energy can be absorbed 
by atmospheric gases reflected by clouds or scattered, right? And so in lab, we actually did a, a little exercise on what percent. So make sure you look at your lab to figure out the percentages of what's being scattered and what's being reflected by clouds. I think it was 20% 20, 20 being reflected by clouds there. Scattering occurs when uh, a light wave strikes a particle and bounces off in some other direction, right? So that's what's happening with blue light being scattered by our atmosphere and then making the sky appear blue. You know, we have this blue sky, but we could also see red sky, especially in the evenings, right? So molecules scatter and dust reflects sunlight. Light from the sky near the sun appears red, right? So blue light scattered, light directly from the sun appears red. So as we scatter more of this blue light, because now when the sun is setting, now we're, we're seeing the light in a thicker atmosphere, right? We're seeing, uh, if we kind of think about the earth over here, so when, when the sun is directly above us, we're looking straight up. But as earth spins and we see, um, we're going to see the sun coming at a shallow angle. Note that we're going through a thicker atmosphere rather than a shorter atmosphere here, right? So that's kind of the idea there is we're seeing this thicker atmosphere and we're scattering um, more of that blue light. So now we see more red light, right? So sometimes the whole western sky seems to glow. The sky appears red because so small particles of dust, pollution, and other aerosols, because we're seeing it a thicker atmosphere, scatter more of that blue light. So if we scatter more and more blue light, then we don't see that blue light and the red light from the sun comes through, right? So that's what makes kind of our sunsets pretty because we have that, that additional thicker atmosphere with more of these particles scattering more of that blue light, right? So um, instead of coming through a thinner atmosphere, thicker atmosphere here. All right, and then uh, I, we, in fact, this is what we do in lab. Uh, we talked about how Earth receives this uneven solar radiation and how the atmospheric cells have to move this heat around. And then uh, we talked about convection, right? So, and then we talked about the Coriolis force here. And so we did this all in class here. Um, I just wanna add a couple of things in here. Uh, we did do um, the Earth-Sun relations. This is part of the lab that we did. In fact, the, the Equinox, it will be on, um, actually it's March 21st, not the 20th here. Let's fix this here. So the Equinox, and so remember the word Equinox means equal night, uh, or I always say equal night and day. So we have 12 hours of daytime, 12 hours of nighttime. And note that the sun is directly over the equator on on the equinoxes. So there's a vernal equinox, which is coming up here. And then as, as Earth goes around here, we, we um, because Earth has a constant tilt, remember this, this, this tilt is 23 and a half degrees with respect to the perpendicular. So if we can make a perpendicular a line through the ecliptic, which is the orbital plane, then the Earth is, Earth's tilt from that perpendicular is 23 and a half degrees. And that tilt is constant, right? And so as, as Earth moves around the sun, orbits the sun, note that, that that North Pole is always pointing way up to the North Star, right? Up to Polaris. And so by the time you get to June 21st, which we call the longest day of the year in the Northern Hemisphere, uh, we call that the solstice. And we, up here we call it the summer solstice. But if you're in Australia, it's a winter solstice. So it's better to use, use the word June solstice because... Um, uh, it refers to the solstice in June, right? Depends on what hemisphere you're in, whether you're summer or winter. But for us, it's the longest day of the year, but note that the sun is directly over the Tropic of Cancer, right? Uh, that, so, so in other words, 90 degrees, if you could draw a, a line along Earth's horizon here, you would make a 90 degree angle at 23 and a half degrees, right? Then as Earth keeps orbiting the sun, you'll end up where the sun is back over the equator, we got the, the autumnal equinox, which is um, actually, again, this year it should be on the 21st, September 21st. And then um, like we like equal night and day, and then we keep going over here, then we get the, the December solstice. It would be our winter solstice. And note that the sun is directly over the Tropic of Capricorn, right? So uh, there's a couple of questions on the study guide and on the exam is, is you'll see a, a scenario like this um, if you saw this and I asked you what day of the year it is, you will say it's, well, the sun is directly over the Tropic of Cancer, so that must be June 21st or 22nd, right? So that would be our, our June solstice. All right, so uh, we did this in the lab, but make sure you review that. 
Then we also talked about the analemma. So the analemma traces the path of the sun in in the sky, right? And it makes this kind of funny loop here. And I'm just not sure why it makes a loop here. We'll discuss this more in um, in, in astronomy because we also use the analemma for astronomy. And so the way you'd read this is is where... So the, the analemma is telling us where the sun is 90 degrees above your position, right? Where, you know, if you had your local flat horizon, then you can draw a 90 degree line directly up toward the surface, right? And so where the sun would be 90 degrees above your head. So if we look at this, note that up here um, on June 21st, right, at 23 and a half degrees, that would be what the June solstice. The sun is 90 degrees above us. Down here on on December 21st, see we're down here at 23 and a half degrees. The sun is directly over our head, right? If you're sitting on the Tropic of Capricorn down here, right? So here they're asking us, well, where are we? Where is the sun on May 5th directly overhead? So if we go to May 5th, we see we got March. Um, here's May, right? So May 5th. You would go over here, so the sun is directly over like 15 and a half degrees, right? So 15 and a half, so if you're at 15 and a half degrees north of the equator, the sun would be 90 degrees above you, straight above you, right? What about on April 11th? So if we go to April 11th, uh, over here you'd be at around eight, uh, yeah, about eight degrees north, right? So let's let's pick a. Um, uh, February 10th, right? In fact, what's today? Today is February uh, 26th. So where are we? So February 26th, so you'd go to 25th, 20, 26th would be right here. So the sun is directly over about nine, eight and a half degrees south latitude. So right now the sun is directly over um, anything that's around nine, nine degrees or eight and a half degrees south of the equator, right? So that's how we read the analemma. We did a few exercises on in class on this.